Good morning. We welcome everyone to our service of worship today, whether you're here in the sanctuary or with us via our live stream. Wherever you are today, we're glad that you're with us as we worship from Rideau Park United Church in Ottawa. The sanctuary where the webcast comes from, where we are gathered here, is on the traditional uh, unsurrendered, unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe, and we acknowledge their stewardship of the land over countless generations. As a community of faith, we commit ourselves anew to the work of right relations. And as we begin in worship, we pause to light candles. We light candles to remind us that the light of Christ shines as we gather around us and where you are this day, the light of Christ shines with you. And as an affirming ministry, we pause to light a rainbow candle as a renewal of our commitment to the way of Jesus, a way of inclusive love and overflowing grace extended to all of God's children and we think particularly of the 2S LGBTQ community. In Jesus' name, all are welcome here. And together we pray. Holy One, source of love. As we gather before you, we pray that you would encircle us with your love that you would bless us with your sustaining presence, that you would surround us with your goodness and grace. Draw us together as one community, open us to the whispers of your spirit and to the leading of Christ our Savior, and we share the words that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we sing together praise to the Lord, number 835 in Voices United. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 in English and then repeat verse 1 in French.
So, a time for all God's children, and uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are in the pandemic as a church. So, in the world and in the church for the last two years, we've been adjusting and readjusting, uh, learning new things, implementing rules and protocols, pulling them back a little bit. We have, in the sanctuary, been allowed to have five people, and then 10, and 25, and then none, and then 10 again, and opening up, and then closing, and opening as the pandemic waves come and go. And we're at a place now where the rules are changing in our province, in our city again. And so as a church, we're thinking about how to adjust the rules into the next few weeks, months, we'll see. And so one of the things that we've done throughout the pandemic since maybe April 2020, when everybody started putting masks on, we, we've been putting masks on. And so whenever we're in the church together, we wear masks, except when you're talking like I am, you can take it off for a bit. And another thing that we stopped doing is singing. Like we haven't had people in the pew singing since March 15th, 2020, which is a long time. So as we move forward now, we're going to keep doing some things and start doing other things. We decided that we're going to keep our masks for a while. If you go to the store, you know, you go to the grocery store, you don't have to wear a mask, but a lot of people are still wearing masks. So we're going to keep wearing masks at least through April. And then we'll see how people are feeling and where we are. But we're going to start singing soon, which is going to be really something. On Palm Sunday, it's two Sundays from today, uh, people in the pew can sing. You've always been able to sing at home. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing from some choir members, I think. So you're going to be able to sing uh, hymns in the pew on Palm Sunday and going forward. Still wearing masks, but we're going to be able to sing. When you come to church right now, in person, you have to register on the website. You don't have to do that starting next week. So we're not going to pre-register. Um, and uh, we've had capacity limits. They say so many people can be in the church. And we never go anywhere near the limits we set. So we decided we're not going to have those limits anymore. And people can come as they're comfortable and be in the space as they're comfortable. So that's where we are in terms of our rules. We'll keep the masks but we look forward to singing in, in two weeks' time. And I thought I'd share with you a prayer that our moderator, Richard Bott, wrote way back at the beginning of the pandemic. It's a prayer for mask wearing, for those of us who continue to wear masks when we're out and about. Let us pray. Creator, as I prepare to go into the world, Help me to see the sacrament in the wearing of cloth. May it be an outward sign of inward grace, a tangible and visible way of living love for my neighbors as I love myself. Christ, since my lips will be covered, uncover my heart, that people would see my smile and the crinkles around my eyes. And since my voice may be muffled, help me to speak clearly, not only with my words, but with my actions. Holy Spirit, as the elastic touches my ears, remind me to listen carefully and full of care to all those I meet. May this simple piece of cloth be shield and banner, and each breath that it holds be filled with your love. In your name, and in that love, I pray. Amen. Break the bread when a hungry child. 
Good morning. The Bible reading this morning is John 18, verses 28 to 38. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Then Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? The reading of God's word. Amen. Let us pray. Ô Dieu fidèle, avec espérance, nous te prions d'ouvrir nos nos esprits et nos cœurs pour que nous écoutons ton message de vie proclamé dans la célébration de ce jour. Ô living God, in hopeful prayer, We ask that you open our spirits, our minds, and our hearts as we listen for your life-giving message in our worship today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What have you done? A woman posted a long message on Facebook last week, letting her friends and family know that she and her partner were 
taking a break from their marriage. They're starting a trial separation, a time for rethinking whether they want to spend the rest of their lives together. We've never been a perfect match, she wrote. Over 30 years of marriage and parenting, we've had many stresses and strains. We love each other. But I have started to question whether we just want different things in the future. The breaking point came, she wrote, when she was reviewing the bank statement and questioned one of the expenses that was listed there. And no, it wasn't a shady motel bill, wasn't evidence of some addictive gambling or drinking or drug use. It was a contribution to a GoFundMe page for the truck convoy. What have you done, she asked. Obviously, it was something she felt very strongly about. This one choice that he made caused her to question whether or not she really knew him. Faced with her accusation, he could only say, Honey, it was just a momentary lapse. I got caught up in the rhetoric. Then he said, But maybe if you take a look at some of the articles I've been reading... And that's when she started talking about seeing a marriage counselor or taking a break. In the scripture reading before us today, Pilate asked Jesus that same question. Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Pilate was already feeling manipulated by the religious authorities in Jerusalem, the ones who wanted to get rid of Jesus. They knew that only the Roman authorities, however, had the power to execute him quickly. However, it had to be a politically based execution. So Pilate had to find political grounds to do what they were asking. He must have wondered, was this guy really setting himself up as a king against Caesar? Was he really seeking to take the place of Herod, the collaborator, king of the Jews? Pilate suspected their reason wasn't political at all. So in this moment, in this trial with Jesus, he wanted to know why the religious authorities were so determined to end Jesus' life. They are your own people, he said to Jesus. What have you done? Jesus replied to Pilate, saying, For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. In one of her books, Barbara Brown Taylor asked a hard question. Have you ever heard someone tell the truth about you so clearly that you wanted to kill them to make them stop? If not, she says, let me introduce you to Jesus. So that's why Pilate asked him, what have you done? Jesus answered all of Pilate's questions, but from a very different perspective. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus did not say to Pilate, I'm no threat to you. I'm just a simple holy man. I don't get involved in politics. Jesus did not say, I'm only interested in the afterlife, in spiritual things. You guys can deal with the politics and justice and government. No, Jesus quite intentionally answered the Roman governor with a different kind of challenge. He may have never called himself a king, but he did use the word kingdom. That was a political word 
So it was almost guaranteed to get him crucified. Then Jesus added this, but it is not a kingdom from here. I have always imagined that at that point in the trial, Jesus looked around, taking in the Roman architecture, the guards with their swords, Pilate himself with fancy robes and symbols of power. And in the midst of all that, there is Jesus saying, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is God's kingdom, a way of love and prayer, of compassion and justice and peace. So Jesus' followers would not free him by violence, as he said. Instead, they would find a different way to build God's kingdom in the face of the empire. Of course, the church that took Jesus' name did not always reflect those values. Crusades, religious wars, colonization, residential schools. At times, we confess that the violence, violence and exploitation and war must have seemed like the most convenient or expedient way for the church to pave a way for the Christian faith in the world. That is the way that Pilate took. Perhaps it's fair then that in our time, it seems like faith is on, a, on trial. What have you done, the world asks us. When we consider that the Christian story began with a humble man who refused to play Pilate's power games, when we compare it to our own priorities, we might agree that it is time to return to our roots. In a world that seems so polarized, we all need the reminder that violence is not a fitting tool for followers of Jesus. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this of his own ministry. As he was promoting Christian nonviolence in the face of violence. The ultimate weakness of violence, he wrote, is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. So it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. What have you done, Pilate asked Jesus. What could you have done to upset your own people so much that they would deliver you to me in chains so that I might take your life. Jesus answered him, I came to tell the truth. Pilate complained, what is truth? Maybe what Pilate wanted were the kinds of facts that he could understand. He wanted Jesus to say, oh yes, he had upset the religious authorities by healing on the Sabbath and turning the tables in the temple, but he really meant them no harm. Or maybe what he wanted Jesus to say was, I'm planning to found a new faith community, and the temple elite are pretty je jealous of my popularity. Perhaps what Pilate even wanted him to say was, yes, I am a rebel king. I have come to overthrow Caesar's power in this place. Instead, Jesus had a whole different approach, definition, understanding of truth. A truth that was born of God's infinite love for all creation, 
that knew no sides. A truth that was only in competition with the iron fist of the Roman Empire because Jesus' truth offered true and lasting hope, not more war. But true hope is inconvenient. It's inconvenient because that hope comes from transformation. Transformation is a lot of hard work. It means giving up much of the power we have always enjoyed, giving up the way we have done things, learning to share uh, with others who have not had the same privilege. It takes listening to those who have never been heard. It takes being, sometimes it even takes being in conflict with our own family, our own friends, our own people. What have you done? I say this, I say that sometimes it seems like our faith is on trial. Because sometimes people of faith find themselves standing up against the status quo when they see that glimpse of the kingdom, potential possibility of equity and peace. They find themselves standing for the most vulnerable in our society, and that contribution is not always welcome. So people of faith stand up for the environment. Muslims, Sikh, Jewish, and Christian, Christians of many different denominations. Creation cannot speak to power, but people of faith can. People of faith are allies of those who experience poverty, racism, homophobia, and ableism. People of faith listen for the truth in the gospel, that God gives, God's kingdom gives us a very different way to live in well-being and equity. You can find people of faith volunteering in food banks and healing gardens, in hospice care, in after-school homework clubs, and street ministry. And those experience influence our own understanding of the truth in God's kingdom and how our strength might be used. What have you done? Pilate asked Jesus. Maybe what Jesus should have said was, I have opened their eyes. Now they will never unsee the vision of God's kingdom and they will continue looking for my truth in every problem, in every injustice, in every dark night of the soul that they face. So may we keep seeing that vision, that truth, and the possibility of God's kingdom in our midst. And may God show us a clear path through all the choices that are before us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
We join now in a time of prayer, lifting up our world and one another in the name of Jesus. And in this prayer, there are moments of silence for you to offer your prayers in the, in the stillness of your heart. As we begin our prayer today, I would mention the sad news of the passing of Mary Harris. And so we keep her family in our prayers and we think too of her many friends here in this community of faith. Let us pray. God of grace and love, we remember the people we know who are living in times of trouble or transition, and we pray for healing and peace for all. We pray for the Holton family and for all those who mourn the loss of Jim, whose life was remembered here yesterday. We pray for Keith and Christy and Tracy and Greg and for everyone in the family of Mary Harris and for her many friends too. We pray for the Ben family in this time of loss. We seek God's encouragement for students and teachers and parents and all those who live with the stresses of school in a time of changing rules and protocols. We pray for grocery workers and frontline workers and medical staff and all those who live in this time. We pray for peace on earth, for the generous sharing of the earth's resources, for the responsible sharing of the world's problems, for understanding between peoples and nations. We pray for the turning of swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and especially we pray for the peace of Ukraine and for the security of its people and for the refugees fleeing conflict there and throughout the world. We pray for our church and for all communities of faith. May we be a channel of hope and love, a witness to justice a place of peace and welcome and compassion. And we commend to you, O oh God, our families, our friends, our own concerns within a, a tighter circle of acquaintance, friendship, and kinship. And we ask for help and courage in the days of this coming week. And we offer our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our example, our guide. Amen.
We welcome, once again, everyone to uh, our time together and I'll lift up some announcements for the week coming. After the church service today, as is the case every Sunday, our Healing Pathway Ministry is offering healing prayer uh, online and you can go to our YouTube site or our church website to find out more about that. Healing Pathway is moving towards opening for in-person healing prayer in the next few weeks as well. This afternoon, um, pageant costume return is happening here at the church, so families with pageant costumes are invited to bring them to the church this afternoon. At 4 p.m., Elizabeth is offering Forest Church today, and we meet here at the church to participate in that. Our UCW is holding an online bake sale March 30th and 31st. We are having our weekly Lenten reflection gathering on Zoom on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Our meditation group meets online on Thursday at 10 a.m. Information about all these things can be found on our website and our social media. And we're going to sing hymn 343 in Voices United, I Love to Tell the Story.
We go now into the world in the name of Jesus. We go to live love and peace and to share hope and courage with the world that God loves. And go knowing the grace of our Savior Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you today and always. Amen.